Okay, so there were a few people asking about my approach to training. So I thought I'd do a video about it. Now, it's sort of very simple, but actually in being simple, it ends up being quite complex. I know. Uh, the simplicity of it is that I focus on getting the muscle to do the work. So, don't get me wrong, like all of us, or most of us, I love throwing heavy weights around. I get a buzz out of moving big weights. But the bulk, the core of my lifting has always been based around how I felt the movement. And the fact that I felt the load in the muscle I was trying to hit. Now, over the years, I've used various things to achieve this. Um, I peer, and I've always periodized my training. Now, it's not been structured, so I've not done all six weeks of this, then six weeks of that. It's been more instinctive. Uh, if I start to lose engagement in the muscle, start to lose feel, then I'll either go back to isolations or, or I'll use TUT. I'm quite, quite a fan of TUT, so uh, time under tension, five seconds up, five seconds down, constant movement. Really good at increasing the, the brain's ability to communicate with the muscle. Really good at getting the muscle to fire in sequence to get the fibers to work sequentially and to get the central nervous system to cooperate or, or control that muscle very, very effectively. And it's painful, and that painful gives you feedback. That painful teaches you how the muscle feels when it's moving. So I'll quite often do periods of TUT. Um, I then generally will start to push load, uh, and then I might go for a period of volume. So it varies. And it's all very much based on, on how I feel. But the core effort of it all is it's not really about what's on the bar. It's about what I'm feeling in the chest or the bicep or the shoulder, whatever muscle I'm trying to work. But the downside to this is you can get very hooked up in the pain. And it's very easy to make a muscle hurt. A static hold in a movement will soon start to create muscle pain. But it's probably pretty fucking shit at generating muscle growth. So even though I'm very focused on feel, I'm also very focused on, on pushing. Uh, and I have the attitude that when my general basis of rep structure is six to eight reps. A couple of high rep warm up, 12, 15, 12, and then I get down to it. I get into sixes quite quickly. But the control, so there'll be a second and a half up, second and a half down. Uh, and um, I've always had a couple of rules. First one is, if I get six reps, I do another set and the weight goes up. And the second one is, if I complete a rep, I go for another. Now, it doesn't matter if that rep's a, a shiting dog, five minutes to get it up, screaming the house down rep. I will lower the weight under control, and I will attempt to start another. Now, there's probably no fucking Cadenelle's chance I'm going to get another rep at that point. But the fact is, I try. And the other thing is, because I use controlled movements, so I'm not, boom, I engage the muscle, and then I try and drive. And if it doesn't move, I still try and drive. So I keep under that load and keep trying to push it. And I'll stay there for a couple of seconds. It seems like hours when you're under it, but it is only a couple of seconds. Um, if you explore, boom, you're very much, oh, it's all or nothing. It either goes up or it doesn't, and then that's where it fucked. Yet yeah, staying under that rep and trying to drive, one teaches you discipline in structure, in holding your shape, in holding your core shape, in the movement, keeping you safer. But two, all the time you're trying to push, the body is trying to signal that muscle to engage more, to engage more, to engage more. And all the time you're working muscle fiber. So it's far more productive at damaging muscle fiber, therefore stimulating growth, than an explosive rep. Now, there's a lot of studies about explosive reps being good at recruitment. And yes, there is an initial hyper recruitment as muscles as you explode. But that load soon dissipates. It isn't sustained on the muscle for prolonged periods of time. And in fact, when you start looking at studies, there's a lot more studies showing that there's a greater recruitment of muscle fiber in TUT work. The negative of TUT is having a sufficient load to damage the muscle effectively. So there's a trade-off. But if you're going to do an explosive rep, you don't start from a neutral, relaxed position and just bang. 
you start by engaging the muscle, start the bar moving an inch or so. I'm using bench press for an example because it's easy. But you start the movement, then you accelerate. So you don't accelerate from a dead stop. You start the rep, move the rep an inch or two, then you accelerate. And you'll find you'll get a lot, lot better muscle engagement. Now, negatives. You do a negative right, and it sets up your positive. Uh, and, and negatives to me are incredibly, incredibly important. So when you lower a weight in a negative, focus on lowering it with the target muscle. Focus on feeling it with that muscle as you come down. So the bench press right, you're, you're lowering your thing, peck, peck, yeah, feeling it on the peck, feeling it on the peck, feeling it on the peck. Very slight pause at the bottom, and then just reverse the process, boom. So that same muscle you're feeling on the way down, you focus on that all the time on the negative. When it gets to the bottom of the movement to the pause, very, and we're only talking incidental pause, you only just, boom, and then move again. You don't have to hold, you're not talking a second, two second hold, it's just, touch, zzz. Then focus on using that same area where you felt discomfort to pull the bar back up. And let's get one thing straight. No muscle pushes. Every muscle pulls. Okay? No muscle pushes. So get away from thinking of pushing and thinking of pulling. When you bench press, your pec pulls your upper arm up, which in turn moves the bar upwards. So um, little terminology like that can really change how you approach the movement in a set and therefore how you feel that set. But if you focus on loading the muscle as you do the negative, holding it on that muscle at the pause point, and then just basically reversing that process on the way up, you'll get so much stronger muscle engagement. Um, now, regarding exercises, grip whips and stuff like this. So... I'm going to use some tools for this. So, every muscle attaches at a hinging point and pulls on a lever. So, for argument's sake, if this is your arm, Okay, the bicep muscle is here, attached to here. So when you contract the bicep, it pulls the forearm. Then when you contract the tricep on the other side, it pulls the forearm back down. That's effectively it. So, start thinking about exercises, not in the travel of the bar or the machine or the dumbbell, but in the travel of the levers and the muscles. So for argument's sake, if this is my lever, this ends my hinge point, how do I create the greatest amount of stress at this point, which is where the muscle is? Do I put the load here? No, I put the load here, at the end of the lever. That point will create the maximum load at this point. So, <clears throat> on single axis movements, it's quite simple. On a bicep, the end of the lever isn't here, sorry, in your palm. It's actually here. Now, the problem is the wrist has a great deal of flexation, so this can deflect load held here into here. So when you're going to do a dumbbell or a barbell curl, try and sit the bar as far back as you can into your hand to get it as close to this point than when the wrist does flexate, which it will do, the least amount of that load is deferred somewhere else. Ideally, you want the load there, but that's not really possible. There are some adaptions you can get, and they're like a plate loaded sleeve that goes on your arm, and that extends the lever off this point, and your hand becomes quite neutral then. Fucking brilliant for bicep activation, but very few gyms have them. So you're looking at getting the dumbbell or the barbell as close to your wrist as possible. Keep that wrist straight. And maximize that lever. Now, if when you curl, your elbow goes back, this is through your center line of gravity. So now you've shortened the lever again because your center line of gravity is now here. And your hinge point's gone behind. So now you've got a short lever. Yes, you'll move more load, but you'll lower the load on the bicep. So elbow pinned slightly forward. Second thing. 
if this is my lever and this is my muscle, big muscle, big bicep, that muscle's strongest and most effective and going to get the biggest stimulant when it's in direct line. If I move the lever to one side, I'm going to change the stimulus on the muscle and it's not going to be as effective or the other side. Now with a bicep you have two heads, so you move one way you'll focus more on one head, move the other way you'll focus more on the other head, that's quite obvious. But it gets more complex when you start getting multiple groupings. So for your delt, you have your medial, your posterior, and your anterior. Your medial moves it in that range. The posterior moves it in that range, and the anterior moves it in that range. Now, if you want to maximize medial delt, then you need to keep straight out to the side. If you want to maximize anterior delt, then you need to stay as close to the front, rear the same. If you move away from the straight lateral movement and start letting the dumbbell drift forward or the arm drift forward, you'll start to recruit anterior delt. So in order to maximize medial delt, you need your arms out to the side. Now, this is where it can get a little bit more complex because our arm has this hinge in the middle. Now, the medial delt attached here moves this lever, which is the upper arm bone. Then we've got the elbow, and then we've got the forearm. It doesn't really matter how high your hand goes, which is on this end. Bearing in mind where my fingers are is the elbow, and the black end of the pen is the shoulder. It matters how far your elbow goes up because the muscle is moving this lever. If you keep that straight, then you will extend that lever and therefore a longer lever means a lighter load will cause a greater load. That The load at this end will be greater here because the lever is longer. But what is important is, is that the elbow travel. It's where your elbow goes that's important. That's why when you see side lateral machines, you do them like that and the pad's here. Because the pad is directly on the end of the load. Boom. But if you're doing lateral raises, you want to be out here. You don't want your hand coming past your chest. If it does, you'll start recruiting front delt. So you get it out there, and it's rear delt. And again, elbow position. It doesn't matter where my hand is. It matters where my elbow is. Now, on something like a bench press, our hinge point is our shoulder still. Now, the pectoral muscle is responsible for primarily moving the arm up and across like this, which is why the fly is such a good movement. But in the bench press, it still moves the arm up and across. It just can't go all the way across because your bands are fixed on a bar. Now, if you want to maximize pec recruitment, then you want to be straight out. If you want to bring tries and shoulders in, then you drop your elbows down. Powerlifters talk because they want to bring the delt and tries in so that it's not just the chest that's benching, it's delt and tries. But if you haven't first built a chest, then you're going to limit your potential for growth and strength because you're going to be relying on your front delt, predominantly, and your tricep, two smaller muscles, nowhere near the size of the pec, nowhere near the potential for power of the pec. So even powerlifters, off-season, bench wide. Then when you start approaching comp, 12, 14, whatever your prep time is, then drop in. You've built pec power over the winter, over the off-season, whatever it is. You've built your pec. You've built your strength in your chest. Now tuck. Now get your shoulders and your triceps working with your pecs. And your bench will jump massively. You don't think this works? Took a guy, Masters, 100 kilo lifter. Uh, best bench was 230. Uh, in six months, we put it up to 270. He was on less drugs than he was ever on, and the only thing we did was we built his pec power in the off-season by wide grip bench. Now, in regards to this, this is where things change slightly. This is my upper arm. This is my body, shoulder, elbow. So this is my lever again. Pec's attached to the end of the lever. But I've got now got my forearm going up. Now, if I want to maximize the load at this point, I need to keep my hand above my elbow. If I go narrow grip here, 
I create a second hinge at the elbow and my low is now pushing down here which is causes low to dissipate into the tricep if I go wide I create another hinge and I start putting the load into the bicep so when I grip the bar and my upper arm is parallel to the floor my forearm wants to be 90 degrees now the load in my hand here pushing down is bang on the end of the lever through the midpoint when you use dumbbells look at a mirror and keep your forearm up all the way through the motion so if you're doing a shoulder press dumbbells you start fucking fucked up with this camera there forearms are parallel to the ground as i come up the forearms stay parallel you see so many people doing this you're much better doing that same with bench press dumbbells you're much better keeping the arms out then bringing them in keeping the hands over the elbows all the time and the reverse is true with back your back contraction isn't based on where the bar goes on a pull down your back contraction is based where the elbow goes now when most people do a pull down they come down they get to about here and then they do that well that's not working your lats that's throwing load up into your trap and your uh, rhomboids now your upper back is naturally stronger than your lats to start with but your lats are the bigger muscle have more potential for growth and strength so as you come down your elbow wants to stay under the hand and you're trying to put your elbow into your side you won't physically do that but that's the aim and where the bar goes the bar goes and you'll find that the bar's not going as deep but your back is fully contracted <laughs> instead of taking all the tension off the back and letting your elbow throw back so when you look at exercises look at the levers involved look at the hinges and make sure you keep the load as close to or as above or below the end of the lever it's quite simple hack squat is an excellent movement for legs now the difference with legs is that you've got multiple hinges so you've got your hip which has a hinge which has a glute attached to it then you've got your quad which then runs down to the knee so when you bend you've got one muscle here the quad core arrangement pulling up from the knee but you've also got your glute at the back pulling up on the spine so it's imp if the ideal this is why the hack squat is actually so good at building quads because you can place your knee direct uh, foot directly underneath your knee and maximize that leverage but what most people do is place the foot underneath the knee like that because it shortens the lever ranges shortens the lever and makes it make us capable of moving more load but that isn't what it's about what it's about is building muscle what it's about is building power and strength if you train for strength you train like a bodybuilder in your off season and then in your comp start adding in all the techniques all the tricks tucking everything else raised heels everything else you can to bring your power forward but your off season should say if you're a bodybuilder then it's the same all year round but just periodize you know spend some time feeling the muscle getting them to work feeling them in the movement teaching your brain that when you do that exercise it's that muscle you want to activate once you get that then start pushing some strength when your strength starts to plateau or you start getting niggles if you're still feeling it move to volume work if you're not still feeling it go back to the focus on feel and then move to volume work and just cycle it, cycle it and it might be that you've got different body parts moving at different points at different times you focus on that true engagement and you won't need lots of sets because that muscle will be working flat out from the very first sets and reps and therefore it will fatigue a lot quicker and you'll get your workout done in a lot less time and a lot more efficiently why is efficiency good well the most expensive thing we put in our body besides probably growth hormone and acrylics is uh, food so why would you be wanting to wasting calories and burning excess calories in the gym that you don't need to burn if you can be efficient with your training and get the maximum stimulus of the muscle fiber for the minimum amount of car um, calorie expenditure then you cut down on the volume of food you cut down on the volume of food then your gut's healthier your body's more efficient everything works better and trust me if you're training for big big size 
there will come a point when you have to put tons of food away. So you want to make sure that every bit of that food you're using is doing something positive when it comes to your objective. So that's very much how I approach training. Um, there may be a lot of questions after this. I'll do my best to answer them as I can. Uh, hopefully that wasn't over complex and you could follow it. But you'd be shocked. Just for argument's sake, next time you bench press, if you don't already do it, set your grip width so that when your upper arm is parallel to the ground, your arms are at 90 degree. Grab the bar there. Then lower the bar to the chest. Okay. And keep the elbows flared and keep the elbows underneath the hands. And then, boom, lift the chest all the time. All the time, lift the chest. Push the head back into the bench. Lift the chest, elbows wide, down, boom. And you tell me if you don't feel that more in your pack than you've ever done before on your bench. Uh, one other thing, posture, 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 posture. If you're getting lower back pumps when you train, it's because your lower back is flexing. You don't get a muscle doesn't pump unless it's moving. So everything you do, chest up, head up, neutral, everything, and keep that lower back in a nice positive curve. Bent over is the same. And you can go incredibly bent over if you can maintain that curve shape in the lower back because the lower back doesn't take load. As soon as that lower back flattens off or starts to bend up as it way, load will sew straight to there. And that's how you hurt your back. Most people's lower backs aren't weak. It's the cores that are weak. And it's the core that fails to support them. Because you've got your psoas muscles inside, then you've got your ab wall, and you've got your spinal erectus. So you've got quite a few muscles going on in there to support core. Make sure that all of them are strong. Do spend time strengthening your core. It was something I neglected for a lot of years, and it cost me dearly. Do spend time strengthening your core. Do spend time on focusing. And don't just do fucking planks and rep after rep after rep. Get some fucking weighted sit-ups. Get some heavy load. Stress those muscles. Get them strong. And then you will have a lot, lot less injuries. You really will. So core is important. Very, very important. And core position is very important. Everything you do, your head should be up, your chest should be up. As soon as you drop your shoulders or drop your chest, you'll throw load onto your lower back and you'll end up with injuries and problems. Okay, that's it. Done. I'm going to get off now. So hopefully you found that useful and I'll speak to you guys soon.